Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Today is a Bob and Richard Answers Their Mail show. Before we get started on the new questions, I made a couple of mistakes in our last mailbag show. One was as minor as it gets, and the other one was not so minor. The minor one was I said our first Gambling with an Edge show was on February 4th, 2011. And somebody says, well, the Wizard of Odds page said it was February 3rd on 2011. Well, the Wizard was right. And I'm amazed that somebody picked up on that. But um, congratulations. I uh, I would give you a shout. I can give you a shout out by name, but I don't know if you want your name mentioned. So um, if you write back to us and say, yeah, you can tell people that I was the one who did it, that then we will tell people who you are. But a much bigger mistake was about foreign players needing to pay taxes on blackjack winnings. The general rule on such things is that all income is taxable unless it is specifically excluded by the IRS. Since I didn't know of any such exclusion concerning blackjack, I said the money is taxable. Big mistake. Blackjack, along with craps, baccarat, roulette, and big six wheel, those winnings are excluded from being reported for taxing unless you are a professional gambler. Since most non-U.S. gamblers do not declare themselves as professionals because there's no incentive to do so in their home country, this effectively means that the winnings of foreigners at blackjack are not taxable by the IRS. I apologize for, about the mistake, hoping that people who listened to the last podcast also listened to this one and now know differently. Our next question. Something mysteriously happened to my video poker for winners software. What can I do to fix it? <laughs> On January 1st of this year, Adobe Flash players stopped being supported, and there were two separate parts of the video poker for winners software that were affected. They are both cosmetic, and neither affects the functionality of the product. The most notable thing is that whenever you first sign into the program, instead of seeing icons directing you to Game King, Triple Play, Multi Strike, Super Times Pay, etc., you now see a big letter F and the letter I. At the top of the page, if you click on the games icon, you're back to where you've always been. From there, it's easy to click on whatever game type you'd like to play. The other change to software affects the super times pay game. When playing this game, you receive a multiplier every 15 hands or so. Now, the in initial image you saw of, of spinning number was supported by flash. And so that's not there anymore. So you just uh, get a couple seconds of dead air and then the multiplier appears, and uh, and the game proceeds. The help desk for the software is still supported. If you call up and say you don't like the software because of these changes and want your money back, the request will not be honored. The software still works fine. The next question somebody asked us says, it's not casino gambling. But I thought I'd ask you if you considered the following an AP move. It relates to getting your COVID-19 vaccine. I'm a healthy 29-year-old and not an essential worker. But in my area, you can line up at places where they give the vaccine. And at the end of the day, if they have any doses left over, they're willing to put them into any available arm. And when you get this shot, you automatically get a regular appointment for your second dose. I did this twice for several hours each time. The first time they didn't have enough extra vaccines, but the second time they did. And my response to that is I think it's a smart move. Getting the vaccine is good. 
Uh, I can't tell you if it's worth ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, or any other number. But avoiding illness and prolonging your life are valuable things. Plus, it helps the overall herd immunity of everyone. If you have the time to stand in line, actually sitting in your car in some places, and are not otherwise eligible to make a regular appointment, this strikes me as a smart move. If you're successful at this, know that if you share your success with others, you're going to get a lot of shit about it. Some people think it's line jumping, and it's inherently unfair. I'm a person who thinks you made a smart move, but certainly not everyone agrees. Do you have any thoughts on that, Richard? Well, yeah, uh, given that the um, vaccine expires and some of it just ends up getting thrown away, then, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that at all. I mean, it's better that somebody gets it rather than nobody gets it. So, um, yeah, I, I disagree with the people who think you're doing something wrong there. I just want to say that also um, they just this week lowered the age in Nevada – um, from 70 to 65, and I was able to – I when it happened, I went on their website at 9 o'clock in the morning, was able to make an appointment for 11.15 the same day, and I was in and out in 30 minutes at UNLV, um, not at Cashman Field, but in the student union at UNLV. So I was really happy with how smooth and efficient the whole thing was, so um, – and I've had no side effects at all. I mean, my arm felt like, you know, when your brother punched you in the arm when you were a kid or something. But other than that, nothing. Although I hear the second dose is when the side effects sometimes hit people harder. On my first dose, both Bonnie and I had sore arms for a couple of days. Um, the second dose, the lady giving me the shot, the vaccine, said it really helps if you stay hydrated and you move your arm a lot. So we both moved our arms a whole lot and drank extra water and didn't have anything, any problems on the second vaccine. So um, so you were doing the funky chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we're doing the funky chicken. And um, so and it it worked. So on um, now I've had the shot. So. So I'm kissable, not that there's any uh, demand for that knowledge or service. Next question. I tried to wong it on the blackjack table this weekend, but most of the tables were full up. So I had to take what I could get. I got to a table where the running count was at best a plus eight, and the true count was close to three. So he doubled his bets at one point. The rest was very low to negative counts. They use an automatic shuffling machine, and I'm wondering if it's able to evenly mix the cards to a high ex so a high count is hard to get. Seems like it is all the time, except when the ASM breaks down and they have to hand shuffle. My only comment on this is I'm under the assumption that counting while using an ASM is largely a waste of time. Richard. Uh, you yeah, you're thoughts? you're confusing. Bob is confusing an ASM with a CSM. So a uh -huh. an ASM is an automatic shuffling machine, and a CSM is a continuous shuffling machine where the cards get sent back into the shoe after a round or two. So um, an automatic shuffling machine just after the shoe is complete, it goes in the machine. They it's shuffled. They usually have another. Uh, six or eight decks ready to go that they pop into the shoe and immediately start dealing again. So um, definitely you can count against an ASM. That's not a problem at all. But um, no, it's it has nothing to do with the way the shuffler is shuffling the cards. It's just when you're playing six or eight deck games, you're going to see many more negative shoes than you will positive. Um, that's just the nature of how card counting works. So has nothing to do with the machine. Um, that's that's just the way it is. And yes, uh, the the restricted number of players uh, is making it harder for players to find seats. So this definitely is a problem for many people. All right. Next question. Someone says he set up a chip bank 
for several casinos where he has around $25,000 in chips for each of these casinos. If He says if he uses a large bet spread, he'll get backed off, although there won't be a CTR. If he uses a small bet spread with large bets, there's a lower profit potential, but a greater risk of ruin. He wants to know what Richard recommends. Well, I, I, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of things to unpack there. So first of all, I would say the CTR is not really relevant. The issue of having a chip, chip bank is not to avoid – uh, the CTR, but to avoid giving them your ID, because once they bar you, which they are going to do regardless of which approach you use, they can spread your name to other casinos. Now, as far as do you want the higher EV per hour or the smaller spread that may lead to more hours but at a lower hourly rate, I, I think that just depends on your risk tolerance, um, you know, and what you're comfortable with. Yeah, and and it also depends, I think, on the individual's casino, uh, how they're going to react to different things. So, I, I, it's really impossible for me to answer. That's something I think you have to decide for yourself whether you want to try for more longevity or, um, you know, higher win rate. Very good. Someone wants to know how we vet our guest, especially the ones who go by pseudonyms. That's like right. all a of recent them, right? guest, <laughs> or most of them. Yeah, yeah Bob Nersessian doesn't use a pseudonym, but other than that. <laughs> now, I said a recent guest talked a great game, but some of the parts of his story sounded like a false narrative. And my response is we're approached at times. Uh, by guests we haven't heard of. We ask them to provide us with the story about what things they'd like to talk about. Usually we can make a judgment then and there. Sometimes, especially with someone from a non-English speaking country, we have a practice Skype call to make sure they can be understood. After a show, we make a judgment as to whether or not we want the guests back. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Uh, Richard. Yeah, this subject came up on the Discord recently, um, and you know it's it's hard, right? It, it's hard to vet people that you don't know. Um, you know, if, if they're, I mean, it's easy if it's someone who's written a book or something, and we're going to talk about their book. But if it's a player and neither of us know the player, well, then we can only kind of go off that initial interview and. Um, yeah, as Bob says, some people we would not have back on. There are, there have been a few pl people we have had on where when the show was over, I thought to myself, if I, if I knew then what I know now, we would not have had this person on as a guest. Uh, but those are pretty rare because I, I, you know, I think our audience is pretty smart and, you know, if somebody's full of crap, I think they are going to pick up on it. Um. So, yeah, we we do the best we can, and still we you know we want to remain respectful to the people that we have on. We're not gonna, um, you know, it's not uh, investigative journalism trying to prove them to be full of shit or whatever. But uh, yeah. All right. Next question, Richard. Do you think there are any blackjack games out there beatable with no spread and just index plays? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, isn't there still three to two single deck at the El Cortez? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, and I'm sure there are still games out there in the world that are advantage off the top in some foreign country, you know, like Colombia or whatever. So, yeah, I'm sure they exist. You just just have to beat the bushes to find them. I'm not sure why you would want a game like that when you'd be able to make much more money spreading. Okay, next question. 
My goal is to have a $30,000 bankroll for a blackjack advantage play. In the past, Richard has mentioned that playing video poker is a good way to build the bankroll. How long does it take to learn video poker? Also, how big of a bankroll would you suggest beginning with? Well, video poker does have opportunities with it, and they very much vary by area and willingness to travel. And there are so many different video poker games. For most people, starting with zero knowledge or zero money and wanting to build up a $30,000 bankroll, a job is a much better option than gambling. Or see if you can inherit some money. But um, but video poker from scratch, it's going to take you a while to get up to 30000 Yeah, actually, I would amend um, what I've said in the past because also the video poker opportunities are – not as good as they used to be. I mean, that's always true every year, but they seem to be getting worse and worse from what I understand. Um, and, yes. and now I think um, if you were starting from scratch, the way to go would be to get into slots because that requires, you know, basically a monkey can do it and uh, it does not require much of a bankroll at all. Um, you know, the hard part is learning how to beat the game, but, you know, that's your job if that's what you want to do. So, but that that I think somebody starting with basically no bankroll, I think, could um, build up a thirty thousand dollar bankroll in slots without, you know, I mean, it would require a lot of work, but you could do it. And probably would require they don't live in Vegas. There are so many slot hustlers here in Vegas that. The opportunities per are just not there. Um, and so going other places, you'll get better opportunities. If you uh, don't understand that bit more, re-listen to the um, interview by Mickey Krim that it was either last week or the week before, and he explains it better than I can. Next question. What's the deal with several casinos not paying out the Tito's ticket in, ticket out with change on them? I know you can take them to the cage, but I always see five to 10 tickets per cash out on an ATM machine. I usually look at them to make sure they're for piddly amounts. And I know it isn't a lot, but when you add them all up, it would surprise me if it was usually a couple grand a day. They have signs up on the machine saying change is it doesn't get paid um but they still pile up on the machine and this is true at a lot of casinos they um they say there's a change shortage if you take the tickets to the cage you can get them uh most people uh don't bother with getting a nickel or a quarter um change so it's slightly annoying, but not really a big deal. Richard? Well, that guy who's trying to build his 30,000 bankroll, he could just go around sweeping up all those tickets, <laughs> you know, and earned a, a dollar a day or something. Um, of course, you oh, I'm get sure it's more than a dollar a day. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and I'm sure there are people doing that. Uh the next one isn't really a question, but it's more of a statement somebody um, sent to us. And it, the um, and it's information that I think a lot of people want to know. He said he was banned from all Caesars properties two years ago for an incident. So with the news of uh, Caesars Entertainment being bought out, he was um now it's owned by El Dorado. Uh, he wants to know if he's still banned. So he tried his luck and tried it. He went to a Harris property and went up straight up to the security and handed them his ID and just saying, I want to make sure I'm allowed on the property to gamble without restriction. If the answer is no, I'll leave immediately. The security officer calls the supervisor to take his ID and goes into the back room for 20 minutes 
and they returned and informed me that he may enter the property and gamble. So with the merger, if you were previously banned from either company, you can now get a fresh start. So I'm not true, sure that's true for all players at all Caesars property, but it's worth a shot. I would not recommend this approach to anyone. I mean, first okay. of all, every single casino may have a different idea about whether you're allowed to play or not. And to go in and just give them I, your ID, if if you weren't on their radar before, now they could update you, you know, uh, in all their properties with this fresh ID. So, yeah, I think this is really a bad idea. I if it were me, I would just go in and attempt to play, of course, not have ID with me, not provide them with ID, and just go try to play. And, you know, if you get backed off, you get backed off. Okay. Oh, but this may be a good thing for poker players who weren't able to play in the WSOP. Um this whole merger may be a boon for those people who couldn't play before and now they might be able to. Yeah, generally poker players give their real names. You have so. to, yeah, and you have to get a player's card in order to play in the WSOP events. So, and give them your social. All right. So the next question is directed to me. Wants to know if I've ever considered videotaping my video poker classes and putting them on YouTube. Um, I did have some VCR videos years ago. They didn't sell particularly well. Uh, I've tried taping some classes while teaching them, and it doesn't work out well. I would need to get into a studio and tape them. Right now, I'm in discussion with somebody who wants to make this happen. Potentially next fall, the regular South Point classes would be moved to a conference room and taped. Whether they would be put up for free on YouTube or sold is a decision to be made down the rule, down the road. We'll see. There's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross before this happens. For sure, if it is going to happen, uh, you'll hear about it here. Next is, this question's for both of you. I'm wondering if you might have different answers. What is the best, play, best way to play casino free play? I'm speaking specifically of a free play offer that I must be used in a machine, video poker, or slots. My options are to vulture a slot machine or video poker like Ultimate X. Play something like 9-6 jacks or go for something with a big potential win and a high house edge. The third option feels right because his risk is zero. However, Bob Dancer in his superb million dollar video <laughs> poker book, thank you very much, I didn't write this, but I approve of this question, uh, suggest free play was simply put back into play like cash. Although I don't think he ever said that directly. Well then, let me say it directly. <laughs> I do not believe that $50 in free play is significantly different than $50 in cash, other than that you must play it through at least once. It is equally taxable. It is not this special sort of found money that is different from other money in your wallet. Richard. Yeah, it's, it's money. So if you can play it with an edge, great. If not, then you want to play it with the least house advantage possible. Yes. Next question. Want, somebody wants to know about what's the tipping policy on a large hand pay. Can you then tell me what your personal opinion is about tipping on a hand pay? You've discussed this before, but I'm interested in learning more. I did get a hand pay recently, and I noticed a lot of workers showed up asking for a big tip. It was not my choice to get a hand pay, as if I could choose to sit down at a restaurant. I'd be happy to walk to the cage myself to get the payout. I just feel a couple hundred dollars is too much 
when you balance it against the losses and the amount of work it takes to bring the tax form and check over to me. Uh, well, you ask 20 professionals about tipping and you'll get 20 different answers. The, I don't know what we're meaning by a large uh, hand pay. Um, if he's given a couple hundred dollars tips, I'm assuming it's uh, at least the high five digits and maybe six. Uh, so there, my opinion is you're not required to tip at all. I think tipping is a strategy, not a duty. Does tipping this person buy you anything? If the answer is no, I sometimes don't tip at all. The answer could be yes if it's a single bartender and I'm wanting on my side. If it's a big promotion and the casinos, the floor people are running around try to service everybody and they tend to go back to the people who tip the best. Um, or if I'm an employee at the casino, traditionally employees tip the best. Um, or if you're uh, teaching video poker classes at a casino, I recommend you tip every time you get a hand pay, big or small. Um, Richard, what's your idea on this? Oh well, you know, I'm not, I'm not really playing anything where I would get a hand pay. But if it was a casino where I cared about, where I'm going to be there a lot, um, then I would probably tip something. Otherwise, probably nothing. I mean, let me relate it to table games. Uh, as you said, are you getting something from the dealer? When you're playing table games, uh, I would not tip as a card counter just because your edge is too small and you can't afford it. When you're playing games with a higher edge, then you can afford to tip, and often it's necessary or the game will disappear. So sometimes you have to control the emotional state of the dealer, <laughs> and if the dealer is in a better mood, the game actually becomes more profitable. So, And I'm not talking about them cheating or colluding or anything like that. I'm just talking about their physical dealing of the game can change depending on the mood they're in. But sometimes, like let's say your, your average bet is $25, and a tip more than $1 occasionally is giving up a really high percentage of your win rate but a one dollar tip on a twenty five dollar bet is so, sometimes considered worse than no tip at all so it's really hard to win there yeah well, yeah as i say it depends on what your win rate is some games you can afford to tip a lot and it's worth it other games you can't and so you don't yep Somebody said they're new to poker and he wants to ma master video poker first and then master table game poker at casinos like Mississippi Stud, Let It Ride, etc. What books, videos, software, websites can you recommend to master video poker? Start with all of Bob's products. And my answer to that is yes, get three copies of each one. And then he says, after mastering video poker, what products would you recommend to master the table game versions of poker? Well, and my thought is, yeah, go ahead. You can go first. Uh, well, I don't know if they're still selling them, but um, James Grossjean had some strategy cards, much like Bob's video poker cards that give you the proper basic strategy for various different table carnival games. Um, and I know he has a new book that will be coming out maybe in a few months, um, about various carnival games. So once that's out, I would definitely get that. And my comment is, other than reiterating to buy three copies of everything I've ever written, um, pick the direction you want to go in. It's going to take you considerable time to master video poker. It's not a game where you can read a book once and have it mastered. You have to practice on a computer, find the games, play the games, deal with the slot clubs, and so forth. Poker, even with the Mississippi Stud and Let It Ride, which I would not call poker, I would call those carnival games, that's totally different. Um, 
In regular poker, you must spend years paying your dues in that game. So pick the direction you want to go. It's not an easy transition from one game to another. AP used to be us against the casinos. It is now generated into AP teams against other AP teams. What do you think about this, Richard? Uh, I don't think it's changed at all. Uh, I think for the majority of APs, it's AP us against the casino. There have always been rival teams. Um, right now, the competition is fierce in slots. And so, <clears throat> you know, there's some nasty stuff going on. I mean, I... 20 years ago, I had somebody rat me out in a casino because um, I was playing games that he felt were his personal domain that only he should be allowed to play. So that kind of stuff has been going on forever. Uh, I don't think it's any more prevalent now than it ever was. So there are always going to be assholes out there. It's just the nature of the sport. All right. Very good. We've got lots more questions. We're going to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back to our questions. The South Point has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. The promotion in March is the $500,000 swipe, spin, and win. You play 2,000 points and you get to spin a virtual wheel at your machine you you will end up with things like five dollars free play ten dollars free play um bonus points and now it's going to include resort gift cards and food coupons the food coupons would be ten dollars off of any restaurant or a free buffet uh, the average in the past of these has been about $12 per spin, which means since it takes you $2,000 coin in to get it is 0.6%. So the first, um, so for $2,000, you can do up to four of these a day. That would make it $8,000. You're basically getting triple points. Uh, so it's like if you're, it's worth $50 a day in EV if you were playing a game to st that was um, even with the house to start with, uh, like NSU Deuces, which is a 99.7 game. So that's an even game to start with. And so to play 8,000 points, it takes you an hour if you play on the $2 single line machine, or it takes you all day if you're playing a 25 cent single line machine. And so that's what that promotion is. At predicted.org, it's a market where you can play small bets on the occurrence of various political events, usually but not entirely in the United States. Uh, the markets active now are how many votes various cabinet nominees are going to get. So those are the big markets now and whether uh, when people are going to sign up for elections in the future. Our listeners receive a one-time offer of a deposit match up to $20 at predicted.org slash promo slash edge. You must play the money through once and cannot withdraw it for 30 days. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of game. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to practice on many of the games. The game of the week is Face Card Frenzy. You can play this game from six coins up through 10 coins, the odds increasing as you place your bets, as you increase your bets. In this game, full houses and quads, including jacks, queens, kings, and aces, return a lot more than usual. To make the math work, all pay schedule categories are bumped up, meaning that you need an entirely different strategy to play this game at six coins as you were at seven coins, as you were at eight coins or nine coins or 10 coins. So it is not that hard to work out the strategy, but smart players will do it before they actually play the game. Next question. I've heard Richard answer this several times. We're gonna give him another chance. 
How does a professional gambler obtain a mortgage on a house? Yeah, you apply. I mean, uh, the same way anybody who you apply, <laughs> you obtain a mortgage the same way anyone else obtains a mortgage. You fill out the paperwork and you apply. So, uh, I mean, unless <laughs> you don't pay taxes, in which case you're a fool. <laughs> you need to file your taxes and you need to get your money. If you're successful as a professional gambler, successful enough to buy a house, which it sounds like you are, then you need to get your money into the system, into banks, so that you can invest it in other things. And the way you do that is you deposit money in the bank and then you and you file as a professional gambler and you pay your taxes. Yep, that's it. Uh, and if if a bank is suspicious of your occupation as professional gambler, perhaps you're going to need a bigger down payment than other people would. But um, but it can be done. Next question. Guy says he's a full-time AP, nearly three times, three years now, and he tells this to almost nobody. If he gets asked what he does for a living, he says short-term investments or speculator. If they want to know more, I tell them that my, bus my business model is so easy to copy and it makes me good money, so I don't want to describe it further. Of course, this produces some suspicion here and there. Most people who ask me this don't even know that I gambles at all. Can you please give me some advice as to how to handle this better? And my comment, it is, sounds like he's doing just fine. Well, Richard? I, I would say that um, you are giving them an answer that is going to want them to know more. When you say it's so easy, it'd be too easy to copy. Well, of course, everyone's going to want to know how you do that. So you have to make it sound boring. Right. You just say like, oh, it's stocks and bonds, you know, make it sound boring or say I sell life insurance. Is your family protected? Believe me, they won't want to talk about that anymore. They won't have any questions about life insurance. But I, I also don't understand what's the big deal. I mean, why not um, just tell them you're a professional gambler? Now, if it's a woman and you're trying to. Uh, establish a relationship, well, I wouldn't do that on the first date because my experience with that was not good. They just don't get it. But, but it turned out pretty well. You ended up with a uh, a really nice lady who was able to get it. So, eventually, uh, yeah, yeah, but it took a long time. The um, I remember um, Laurie Chang, John Chang's wife, uh, she sells Amway. She actually does as a part of what she does when she's not gambling, which she doesn't do very much anymore. And she will, people want to know what they do, and she'll start telling them about Amway products and how good they are for your skin and for your health and for your da 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 da. And people's eyes glaze over, and they walk away from her so fast. So yeah, that, that's another good way to get rid of people. <laughs> okay. People say that certain machines are tight or loose. My question is that other than adjusting the pay schedules, what else can casinos do to affect payouts? And... Tight and loose are not well-defined machine, not well-defined terms. Uh, there used to be lots of signs in Vegas that our, our machines are looser. Sometimes they will quantify that, or our video poker machines are so much looser, and they do it by taking the average return on the machines. Usually, when somebody is lost over the last 10 minutes, they they say the machine is tight, and when they and they really don't say too much when they win because they kind of expect that. Um, but the way casinos adjust things other than pay schedule is they also can reduce the slot club, which can affect whether a machine is playable or not. There's a lot of little benefits that 
casinos can take away one at a time and they're not really noticeable, but in some they add up. Uh, one casino used to have a daily multiplier for everybody that would, if you've at a certain tier level, would be three or four times and sometimes 5x. And now they don't have that other than twice a week where it's 4x for everybody. Otherwise, it's 1x. And uh, other casinos like stations have cut their slot club in half and done away with a lot of multipliers and done away with the loosest machines. So a lot of things they can do, but pay schedule is the main thing and slot club is the other. Next question. In blackjack, why do you assume that a dealer has a 10 for a hidden card? Is this the right assumption in a six deck shoe? Is this correct basic strategy? And since Richard's the blackjack expert, I'm going to answer it first. Um, it's not a proper assumption. If the dealer has a nine showing, the proper strategy is to hit until 17. If you were actually assuming the dealer had a 10 in the hole with his nine showing, you would hit a 17. Uh, some people explain the strategy is to assume the dealer has a 10 in the hole. It's a simplified explanation and not always true. I recommend not making that assumption. Richard. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, you don't make that assumption. It's the kind of thing dealers will tell you, which which means they really don't know anything about the game. Okay. Can you recommend a good value book that is easily available to buy for someone who wants to get into card counting? Uh, the book that I usually recommend is um, Blackjack Blueprint by Rick Blaine. Uh, Knockout Blackjack is also very good. Um, I mean, there are lots of them. And Colin Jones, a 20th century card counter, is also good. Yes. Yep. Okay. During your career, was there ever any moment when you were on the verge of dropping everything? And why? For me, it depends on what you mean by on the verge. <laughs> I quit backgammon because I couldn't win at it and had to go out and find a job, which was humiliating. I quit blackjack because the casinos in Las Vegas told me not to come back, and I thought that meant I couldn't go back. Since I've been doing this show, I realize a lot of people go back to casinos to tell them not to go come back. Uh, when he found video poker, um, then I found my way in the game. Uh, a girlfriend, Jenny, who uh, was with me when I started playing video poker, left because... Uh, she didn't think the video poker earnings were ever going to be sufficient to make it for both of us. And she didn't, um, so she bailed. So it turned out as soon as she left, uh, I started doing pretty well, which I think was coincidence, but I'm not sure. Video poker aren't what they used to be. I may end up giving up this game when I grow up. <laughs> Richard, have you ever been on the verge of dropping everything and why? Well, yeah, when I first started counting cards, I uh, lost for 160 hours. I've told this story many, many times. Uh, I was losing for 160 hours, and I quit. I was like, this sucks. Um, you know, so I stopped. Fortunately, I had a friend who came to me and said, hey, you have to give this another try, because he had joined a team, and they started winning money like crazy. And fortunately, I, I went back and started playing again and started winning. Um when I moved to Los Angeles and uh, started acting and doing a little work in film and television, I reached a point where I went, you know what, this sucks. I thought I wanted to be an actor, but I don't, so I quit. I, you know, I gave that up. Uh, I gave up backgammon when I just realized that uh, I hated the people. To in order to win money at backgammon, you had to play people who were really sort of nasty and awful and and I just hated it so I quit that I'm I'm a big believer in quitting I mean uh life is about um being happy and if you're doing something that is not making you happy then I am a big advocate of quitting All right I'm glad he hasn't quit this show. We've just had our 10th anniversary, and I'm uh, 
don't know how much longer we're going to go. I hope it's a long time. So for Richard, the, what's the best country you've played in and why? Well, I I don't know. Depends on what you mean by best. The, the country I won the most money in was uh, Korea. Um, so I guess that answers the why question. <laughs> um, but uh, Poland was great. I mean, when I've played in foreign countries, usually it's because uh, the game had some kind of big advantage better than in the U.S. Or it had it, they would just allow you to play. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess best really would be the United States. I, I guess I've won more money in the United States than in Korea, but um, – yeah, I, I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, as I say, if, it, if it's just about the money, then I guess the U.S. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's the U.S. simply because 99% of my play has been in the U.S. It's uh, I haven't done overseas traveling for gambling. Next question is, while in the casino, what's your most memorable moment with the casino Patron, positive or negative? Uh, for me, um, memorable. A, a couple of stories come to mind. Uh, one, I was sitting on a game, and behind me was a roulette table, and it had one of those uh, electronic signs that show the last – sort of. Yeah, that show the last 25 numbers that have come up. And this was 20 years ago when those signs were fairly new. And a player on the table said, you know, I was watching this show on the Travel Channel, and a guy said that, that when they put those signs on the roulette table, the hold went up 30%. And I realized that the guy was talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because I used to do these shows on the Travel Channel, where they, they used to shoot shows about Vegas all the time. So yeah, I just sort of kind of pulled my hat lower on my head and <laughs> kept my head down. Um, another time, I was on uh, a table with uh, two other uh, Hall of Fame members, and you know, some guy on the table made some comment about one of us making some bad play, which may not have been a bad play. I don't remember what it was, but one of my teammates says, well, you know, according to the to the book, you know, such and such is the right play. And the civilian says, yeah, well, the guy who wrote the book is not here on this table. And I just found it really funny since all three of us had written books <laughs> and we're all <laughs> we're all on that table. Uh, but yeah, I've had a lot of uh, interesting encounters with civilians on tables. Uh, I remember one time uh, we were trying to get two civilians off of a table. There were three of us on the game, and we we needed the entire table to ourselves. And uh, I, I think I've told this story on the show before, but uh, we're doing everything we can to get rid of these two people splitting tens, hitting 15 against a six. I mean, just it's switching back and forth from one hand to two hands, just anything we can to get rid of them. And one of the guys is just going crazy. It's driving him nuts, but he won't leave. But he keeps complaining. And finally, one of us does something, and the guy goes, I can't believe how bad these guys play. It's just incredible. And the other guy very calmly goes, oh, no, they know exactly what they're doing. These three guys are together, and they're trying to get us off this table. And I was just like, oh, holy shit. You know, because we're all acting like we don't know each other, but the guy just nailed it exactly. Um, what do you say at that point, you know? I don't know. Did you leave? Uh, you no, I, we waited them out, and eventually they left, and um, we we got the table to ourselves. I remember another time, uh, it was when SARS was the big panic, 
and we were trying to get somebody off a game. And I just kept coughing. And I said to the dealer, oh, could I get some water? I haven't been able to get the, get rid of this cough since I came back from Hong Kong. <laughs> and the guy that we were trying to get rid of immediately got up and left the table. So um, SARS was sort of the COVID of the day, and people were very afraid of it. Yeah, the um, recently, though, sometimes people faking it have gotten arrested and stuff for the uh, equivalent of yelling fire in a crowded theater. And so I was um, – I remember back to when you've told that story before and figure you were fortunate that you had no negative consequences there. I, I had been to Hong Kong. I mean I don't know what they could – do to me if, if I, you know, I didn't say anything that wasn't true. Well, I guess I, I didn't really have a cough, but. So, and answering the question for the same question for casino personnel, <clears throat> I don't remember his name, but he was a blackjack foreman at the frontier back when the strike was going on in the early 90s. He told the story of playing blackjack at a table, betting black chips, and a loudmouth woman kept berating everything he did. And her suggestions were awful, like to stand on an A6, where really the only two plays under consideration are to hit or to double. Um, and even though this guy was playing correctly, he was losing every hand. He was down to two red chips. He bet one of them. He was dealt a natural, and he decided to double down. The lady shrieked and left the table. He said it was the best $5 bet he ever made. Uh, so if you're talking about bosses, I remember there was a boss named Vic Wakeman, and he was a little person, um, you know, maybe five feet tall. And he worked at various places on the strip. But I remember one time I was playing in Bally's when he worked there. And they had a really good shuffle tracking game. So I was always betting big off the top of the shoe. And he came over and he was giving me the evil eye while the dealer shuffled the cards. And, um, the, you know, I, I cut the shoe and I bet two hands of 500 off the top. And he just walked up. And he pushed my bets out of the square, and he said, I don't know what the fuck you're doing, but go do it somewhere else. <laughs> and I just, this guy was sort of the nemesis for many players because, as he admitted, he didn't know what we were doing, but he just knew we were up to something. You know, He barred a lot of people without knowing what was really going on, but kind of had a nose for it. Yeah, you didn't go there to gamble that day. You went there to win. No. All right. We still have lots of questions left, but we're going to call it for now because at the end of our show, we like to have what we call a recommended section. And so, Richard, do you have a recommended for our listeners today? You know what? Um, I do not. So it's a good thing you do because I actually do not have a recommended today. Well, actually, I have two. And... Uh, the first – oh, actually, they both have to do – well, the first one has to do with Richard. Uh, as you know, we're both into storytelling, and he was interviewed recently uh, uh, as a storyteller by, by a guy who hosts a lot of storytelling events. And Richard goes through kind of the basics of storytelling, what it is. So there's nothing earth shattering news. But if you haven't really considered what makes a good story and what doesn't make a good story, Richard lays it out pretty good. And the second recommended is also related to storytelling. Um, on Sunday, February 21st, both Richard and I were in a 99 second story contest where there were 17 people competing and uh, six goes on to the finals and one ends up winning. So these are, of the 17 original stories, 
probably 13 of them were pretty good. Um, Richard did better than I did. I did not embarrass myself. Uh, and if the idea of telling a story in 99 seconds for them uh, is actually takes a lot of work to get a beginning, middle and end and make it all hang together. But the people who were in this were accomplished at it and it's an enjoyable event. So Richard will put the links to both the the interview and yesterday's 99 second slam. And although we have, uh, we do not have enough questions for another show. So it's up to you, our listeners, to get busy and send us some more questions. You can send it to uh, gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com or send it to either Richard or me personally, and we'll get it on the list. Uh, we do this periodically, but usually when we're between other guests. We don't have other guests. <laughs> and so uh, as of this moment, we do not have a guest for next week. So get busy and ask us some questions. Or, or the uh, person who asked us how we vet our guests, go vet some guests for us <laughs> and yeah, send them our good. way. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, Richard. These are always fun. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>